Welcome to The Fifth Kind TV. It's our great pleasure today to welcome back a friend of ours, Matt LaCroix. Now, when you were at school, certainly when I was at school, history began, what, about 5,000 years before Common Era. I then discovered that agriculture had been around for about 10,000 years. Then one day I went to Lascaux in France and saw the cave paintings there and I was told they dated from between 30,000 and 17,000 years ago. And then I moved to Australia and discovered there'd been a continuous culture here uh, for about 60,000 years, at least. And then more recently, we're discovering that people of our design and build have actually been around for 200,000 years, at least. So things are getting older. The plot is thickening. Here to help us explore all that further, puzzle it out and solve every question is author and researcher and Renaissance man, Matt LaCroix. Matt, it's so good to have you back on the show. Paul, I'm so happy to be here to talk to you again. Um, I really admire all of your work and I, I love having these deep discussions with you. Oh, likewise. Now, just in case there's anyone watching who's not already familiar with you, tell us a bit about what it is you do. Okay, well, thanks, Paul. I appreciate that intro. Um, I'm a guy who's always been incredibly inquisitive with, I guess you could say, the nature of reality. You know, what defines our purpose here? What defines everything around us? And I was the, the kind of kid that, you know, there would be a group of friends all, you know, goofing around inside, playing some games or something, and I might be outside on the lawn in the middle of the night, staring up into the heavens, just being in total awe of this place that we exist in. And I always found it really peculiar that a lot of people that I was encountering really weren't sharing that same passion that I was. And as the years progressed with spending a lot of time hiking and having incredible adventures out in nature and just really just exploring what this all was and, and, and what my purpose was here, I started to have a lot of big holes, a lot of questions that just did not have answers. And that's what led me down this rabbit hole, rabbit hole over the last um, many years now, um, at least 10 years of just researching as much as I could into ancient knowledge, into modern um, physics, into looking at the metaphysical nature of reality, looking at ancient civilizations, asking questions like, well, is, is this timeline that we're taught, is this incredible epic of human history that we're, that we're told is only sophisticated in terms of civilization, five, 6,000 years old, could it be much older? And as I started to write, um, I wrote a couple books, The Illusion of Us and Stage of Time. I started to just uncover more and more, along with a lot of of such really as yourself good. that all are bringing these pieces to the table they're all saying hey look this is part of coming out of the book of genesis this is coming out of a cuneiform tablet this is coming out of an ancient site looking at the archi um, the architecture and how the building building was designed and how precise it was all of these questions are coming to the table and so i wanted to really bring this research to the foreground but in instead of just proposing theories and concepts and in, in, in my own hypothesis of what could have happened, I try to bring with this evidence and, and the closest I can get to what seem like concrete facts, if you could call them that. Now, you've done a brilliant job, done a brilliant doing job of doing that and uh, bringing a coherent picture uh, from all the uh, pieces of knowledge that are out there. Can you say a little bit more about what your sources have been? And so what we're going to be talking about today and really getting into the heart of is, well, what is this timeline of human civilization? You know, how far back do we go? Not necessarily that cave in Africa with some primitive hominid that wasn't part of what I consider this, this story. I think that was part of another story. But I, we're talking about human civilization, agriculture, creating um, building structures that are sophisticated. How, you know, how far back does that go? How far back does what we think of as the modern Homo sapiens sapiens so sapiens story, where our brain sizes jumped, you know, in a very short time? You know, that story is what I'm particularly in interested in because when I started to look at a holistic approach to this, that's how that's the kind of facts that I want to bring to this is saying, well, okay, well, what could we base a timeline on? Are there any writings that survived? Right. Well, yes, there are. 
And that's what we're going to start getting into. There are writings that survive that talk about a lot of these events. Okay, well, is there geological data that can support it? Yeah, we're going to look, we're going to talk about everything from ice core samples all the way to different sediment layers that tell like story like a tree ring. And then, well, what about physical evidence that's on the ground still? Yeah, we can get into talking about some ancient structures that are potentially far older than we've been told, which uh, looking at all of this from um, the perspective of combining ancient writings, combining geologic evidence, looking at climate data, combining uh, things like looking at where uh, ocean levels were and, and, and civilizations that are underwater, and then and finally looking at these, these structures themselves, we can put together a picture that's, that clearly states one thing, and it says our story is so much more incredible and older than we've been told. And I think that itself is what is being hidden all along. Definitely. We can have a long conversation on every single point you've just mentioned. But in this timeline, where would you, this timeline, where would you like to begin? Should we start recent or should we start oldest? What do you think makes the most sense? Do we want to go all the way back and come, come to the beginning? I, I generally like to go real old, I think. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So um, I want to just point out what, when we start getting into this conversation um, on my website, thestageoftime.com, this timeline is on there on one of the pages, and you're welcome to go read some of these ancient texts as well as check this timeline out yourself. Um, I put a lot of work into it. I, uh, Paul, we... You and I have been researching for a long time, and I just keep I kept getting questions. People would say, you know, I know I know you mentioned in one of your books or in your videos about this being this old and this falling into this place, but it's hard for me to keep it all together. You really need to really would be helpful if you could make some kind of a timeline to put in a lot of these major events so we can try to figure this out. And so I spent a lot of months building upon the research that I had done over many years in writing to say, well, where do these things actually fit and can I actually make a timeline that makes sense to include them all in it? And that's what I uh, essentially uh, am, am going to be presenting and we're going to be talking about today. But this timeline goes back 200,000 years. I wanted to keep it a nice round number, but I want to just start by putting out the, the message of just you know pointing out that it's possible that this timeline goes even older. You know, it maybe does go to 250. I'm not stating unequivocally, unequivocally that this is the exact number, but I wanted to try to create at least a ballpark where we could try to fit a lot of these events into something that's more of a clean, um, linear perspective. Sure thing. Now, I've heard that figure, ballpark figure, 200,000 years ago, people of our design and build living on this planet. How do we know that? Well, we get a couple different sources for that, and one of the the things that one of the problems I want to point out is when you're talking about something that's two hundred thousand years old, that may be may not seem like a big deal if you just throw that number to someone who's not really looking and thinking like in an actual um, measurement kind of way. When we think about how we're told the human civilization is only sophisticated as in agriculture forming and laws and rules and, and that's the structure of a civilization, when we're told that that's only 6,000 years, we're, we're essentially saying that everything that's been created of sophistication falls in that tiny little window, everything. And when we get a lot of these issues that pop up all around the world with new discoveries that are being made and that come along, we have to scratch our heads to say, well, where does it fit in? You know, what, what is the most logical place for it to fit in if we have an open, objective mind that isn't, you know, constricted by the condition that we've been taught through school and all through our lives where this archaeological ancient history club that exists in our world, you know, you're really not allowed to go outside of that or you get challenged in a, in a very significant way to the point where your reputation can be destroyed. And so oh, I feel, absolutely. go ahead, Paul. Uh, no, you're exactly right. Um, just keep going. I don't want to interrupt your flow. So how do we get 200,000, right? Where does a number like that come from? Well, the first place that I want to start is with a geneticist that I think is really brilliant, especially with this geneticist work. You know, he covers a lot of areas, but in, in terms of looking at the human history and looking at anomalies, looking at the, the physical structure, the brain structure, Lloyd Pye to me is the king. 
He's the king of that research because he was one of these really rare geniuses. And I really don't use that term very, very often. But if you listen to some of his lectures, the guy is just unbelievably smart. And he really has done his homework. And what, he, what happened is, it's a story similar to a lot of other stories, whereas someone who had professionally studied gen geneticist work and looking into the human story, they just happened to be open-minded enough and come across a piece of evidence that allowed them to want to look in a, in, a, in a different way. And he took all that knowledge he did of studying this homo sapien sapien um, current um, stage that we're in now, and he saw all these really weird anomalies. He saw all these really strange anomalies that don't go with this Darwinian evolution approach of saying, well, we came from apes. We evolved straight out of apes. There's no influences from anything else that is out there. We just came along from apes and slowly but surely a few of those apes maybe ate a mushroom here or there or something happened. And then they, boom, they jump started and they, they developed that their brain jumped in size, doubled in size, and then they became like these internal beings of the universe connected to higher consciousness out of nowhere, just completely out of the blue through this random approach. And as I started to dig into that and then, and then researchers like Lloyd Pye came along and are saying, well, wait a minute, if we're the product of thousands and thousands and thousands of years of just completely linear evolution, then why are we in the state that we're in now? And what do I mean by that? Lloyd points out that we're actually not that well designed to survive on this planet and to in, in a way where you would think of being out in the wild and, and being able to hunt and fish and survive against all the elements. We actually are very poor runners. Our, our physical structure is not designed in a way where we could um, achieve something like a lot of the other species that hunt us or we hunt. It seems like we're more designed we're we're here in more of a way where it's about energy. It's about like a stage, like a like a body temple where we where we're the purpose of us. It's more of to reach higher stage of consciousness. So the whole evolu Darwinian evolution aspect started to have a lot of holes. I questions came up like, well, if we come from apes, then how come there's never been a primate that's been observed changing into some kind of a Homo sapien? Why has that never even been observed in the most minor scale possible, macro versus, versus micro? And so Lloyd Pye bring, bring up these great points about how, well, if you study these jumps in the human brain and you study these physical changes that, that, that seem to happen to Homo sapiens sapiens, you can get some kind of a number that really falls around 200,000 years. This Adam and Eve story that's in, the, that's in Genesis talking about how we seem to come out of nowhere. Just out of nowhere, poof, just like that. And we were here and we're basically like creator gods that are being ruled over by all these different places in the heavens. And, and you know, what is the deal with that story? Well, going beyond just those types of analysis, we find this one particular cuneiform tablet called the Sumerian King List. Now, I know Paul is very familiar with the Sumerian King List. Um, and now for people who don't know, if you were, for those who don't know what, what um, cuneiform writing is, if you were to try to leave a message behind, writing on a cave wall or trying to write in like paper with pen or pencil or even trying to paint something on like a great mural, how long is that really going to last? You know, 1,000, 2,000 years maybe, 3,000 years if you're really lucky. But what if you wanted to preserve a message for over 10,000 years, you know, how would you do it? And that's, I think, where the sophistication and brilliance behind groups like the ancient Mesopotamians, the Sumerians in, in particular, that's where I think the brilliance of them came out of this. Because when you look at history, we think, oh, well, the, the people that lived there have always had cuneiform writing and they read it and they understood it. Well, it's not actually the case. In fact, the Sumerians and the Akkadians were the only ones that wrote cuneiform writing and then it died out. It became a dead language for thousands and thousands of years. Well, what's the point I'm trying to make here? Well, that writing, that cuneiform writing was done in such a way where they etched it into clay and sometimes rock and they baked these clay and turned them into these tablets that essentially could survive massive fires and great disasters. And what happens? Well, 
In 1849, a man named Austin Henry Laird was digging in the ancient site of Nineveh, Iraq, and he came across the greatest library ever found in history, making something like the Library of Alexandria in pale in comparison. And that was known as the Ashurbanipal Library. And he found 30,000 cuneiform tablets covering all different aspects of the way of life that once existed at that time. But it wasn't what he found was so interesting. It was it wasn't that it was just talking about laws and selling wheat and which was called um, they used a bushel of wheat to decide their currency known as a shekel. That wasn't what they were really talking about. They were talking about things that were incredibly important events that were that shaped the entire world. That's what they needed to record. And that's what these tablets were. And so one of the tablets known as the Sumerian King List it's this particular strange tablet that lists out all of these different reigns of these different kings that ruled. And it lists these very specific cities. And this is what drew my attention in a great way because I said I, I was always told that these stories were just myths. You know, you take something like the Epic of Gilgamesh, just a myth. Well, then why are these very specific cities mentioned all across these tablets found sometimes hundreds if not thousands of miles away all these same cities are mentioned and all these same types of events occur so i started to think and, and like you know paul when you add up all of the reigns of the different kings and cities and the epics that transpired in the sumerian king list and you take into account the history that that has happened also since then you get something like over a little over 200,000 years and so it matches up with the geneticist research that Lloyd Pye did, did, which gives us this story of, well, where did mankind begin? Could you just address the question? People say uh, the King's List is confusing because it appears to use two units of time so that the short reigns on the list are measured in years and then the longer reigns, and you can clarify how long those were, are measured in SARS. But in actual fact, according to my study, they're all part of the same counting system. Can you just speak to that? Yeah, great point, Paul. Um, we're talking about an ancient counting system that is basically extinct, similar to the cuneiform writing back in the in, in, long ago. They were trying to measure time. Time was everything to them. These the ancient temples were measuring time. The reason why they needed to know time was because they needed to understand what are known as the ages of the zodiac, the procession of, of the equator of our planet, the equinox changing. And so when they were measuring, they would measure how long the reigns were of these kings because they essentially were keeping track of time. Well, how does that make sense? Well, these kings were living so astronomically long. And and it's not just – this is the point – I. I bring up some say, well, like you said, well, a SAR isn't really, they're not really measuring those in years. They're measuring them maybe like months or days. And that's not really as long as it's shown. But then we find things like the book of Enoch and all these other descriptions of Enoch and other ancient, ancient people or beings that seem to live for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's not just the Sumerian king list that mentions humans or beings or whatever you want to call them from back then ancient lineage of of the human that were that were mentioned in the Sumerian king list as legend of living for hundreds of thousands but there's a lot of different writings that mention that there was people back then that lived far longer than we do now and so when i see that from multiple sources it makes me not um question it as much because there's other credible sources out there that can connect that those types of longevity and dates so when we cross refer that it turns out that SARS and years are actually part of the same counting system. And it's a system based on uh, 60s, isn't it? So we've got 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. That's from that culture. Then we've got 3,600 years in a SARS. And when we add it all up, we get back to this astronomically ancient age, more than 200,000 years ago. So we have it in the Sumerian kings list, we can cross refer in other mythologies. When we go to physical evidences, uh, whether we're looking at the ice core or, or things like that, what, what things in the material world are we finding that correlate with those reports? Yeah, that's a great point, Paul. Well said. To me, 
we, you know, and, and I got to just point out, it's not like we have this mountains of evidence that are just sitting there for us to pick through. We're talking about well over 10,000 years ago. It's very difficult for things to survive. You don't have a lot to work with. That doesn't mean you don't have anything to work with, but you don't have a lot to work with. And but what makes me confident about where a, where a lot of these at least loosely fit is that there's clues hidden within them that allow us to point to where they may have fit. For instance, something like in the Sumerian King List, it mentions that there was a great deluge, a great disaster, that then there was new cities that had to be created after in new kings. Well, when did that disaster happen? That's where we start to be able to say, ah, okay. Well, we, if we figure out when that disaster happened, we can then place where this fell on the timeline. And that's what I've essentially done with not just the Sumerian king list, but the Atrahasis, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Legend of Atana, um, and many, many, many others to try to say, oh, okay, so that's why these are mentioned in such a way, and this is mentioned in another way. It's because they're actually talking about a certain point of time where these events transpired. Now, the place right in the middle of the timeline I want to I want to mention, and then we'll sort of go a little a little bit backwards again before we go forwards. Now, right in the center of the timeline, you'll see something called Gobekli Tepe. Now, the reason why that's an important milestone is that here in the Anatolia region of Turkey, right in the center of the heart of the ancient world, you have an astronomical temple. That's and that's really what that temple was. For those who don't know that. The Gobekli Tepe is a circular temple made with these massive T-shaped stones that weigh multiple tons in some case. They're, they're, they're huge. And this temple was deliberately buried with, you know, feet after feet of, of rock and gravel to preserve it below the ground deliberately. And some have even estimated that it may have taken, in some ways, more time to bury it than it did to even build it. That's how obsessed they were, they were about preserving it. Now, what does that matter, right? Well, when they were ex excavating um, Gobekli Tepe, which they're still doing now, they found that around these T-shaped pillars, they were finding very, very minor amounts of organic matter that, was made, that, ma that managed to, to squeeze its way into some of the cracks. And they were able to um, radiocarbon date that organic matter to get a date that is accurate about when at least that organic matter was there. And that's the one, that's the great point I want to point out about um, radiocarbon dating is it's not that that date may be too old. It's that you can't date rock. So if you're getting organic matter in rock that has a certain date, that those structures, those rocks, may be actually much older than even that date. So the, what's, what's crazy about that is that when they've done multiple radiocarbon testing of Gobekli Tepe, they're getting a date that's somewhere around 11,600 years old. It's between that and maybe 12,000 years, somewhere in that window. And what makes that so significant is that the entire story of us that we're told, this Rockefeller history that's in our American history books, says that everything came from a window of 6,000 years ago. When, you know, the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia developed agriculture and then the dynastic Egyptians and then we get the, the Roman Empire and, and so on and so on, which we'll, we'll cover in, as we go along. But so wait a minute. So we have a temple, an astronomical temple that was mapping the zodiacal ages of the movements of our equator the, over a 26,000 year period precisely mapping each age that is exactly 2,100 years. And the age we're getting is more than double the age of the entire, that human civilization is supposed to be here. That doesn't make any sense. And that, that is to me is one of the great smoking guns behind us, you, Paul and me, and me and others being like, well, we really need to figure out this human story. We really need to figure out how far back we really go. It's an amazing uh, piece of geography because what we have there really seems to be demonstrating a pivot in the story of Homo sapiens because there at Karakadag, we've got the first farm, the, the evidence of the first farming in our known civilization, and then predating it just down the road is this megalithic structure that seems to be the remnant of a culture that's far older. 
And so it's it's a really linchpin part of the world because it's a it's a an object lesson in an older developed civilization preceding a new and emergent civilization. So what happened in between people of our design and build being on the planet 200,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago? What were our ancestors doing in the interim? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Paul. And I think the most important point to point out that when we're, when we're discussing this is we say, okay, we lay down a foundation of where we can try to put these as, as moving pieces so we don't lose track of ourselves, right? And I think that's what every good researcher who's out there should do is say, okay, that Gobekli Tepe number, let's make that a foundation and boom, we'll put that there. And let's try to put the rest of the pieces together based on that. Because when you get that jigsaw puzzle piece that you find right oh my god i found the puzzle that it goes in right here this is where it fits we should we should take that as a really serious moment to then say well this is a certain chapter well how far back do those chapters go you know what is this incredible story that preceded us because i think really the ultimate question that comes up is that if we have lost civilizations ancient civilizations that were destroyed from some great disaster then how does that redefine our own experience here as a human? How does that redefine how we think of ourselves? If we're not a, a, a Darwinian evolved ape that just came from nothing, but our story goes back to all these different epics where knowledge seemed to be imparted and great civilizations emerged that emerged that knew aspects of our, uh, our earth and, and our energy fields that we don't even know now. It means that those civilizations were in many ways not maybe on a computer level with cars driving around with, but I think that it's difficult to measure sophistication, but I think that they were more sophisticated in their understandings of energy and consciousness and understanding ley lines of the earth and how to build structures to harness energy and, and basically connections to the stars. And we have completely lost track of that due to what you mentioned, which I really believe, and we'll get into some of the evidence here, which is that, when you look at ice core samples from Greenland, which gives us a snapshot, only a 20,000 year snapshot, that's the part that's difficult with this, is we, we only get a 20,000 year snapshot, which isn't a lot if we try to incorporate like a 200,000 year timeline. But what we do get to find out is we say, hey, these tablets and a lot of these ancient stories from cultures around the world speak of a great catastrophe here or a multiple great catastrophes that wiped out a, a past culture. So when was that disaster? And that the most common piece of evidence that we have within that timeline is when we look at soil layers and where they where they line up on the earth with like this ash layer basically from extreme burning where we find all around the world. And then we look at ice core samples and we see, well, wow, look at that snapshot into the climate of our earth over the last 20,000 years. We complain and talk all about how the climate is shifting so rapidly right now and all these things are happening. But when you look over the last 10,000 years, our timeline, um, according to the best data we have, is that it's barely even a blip in any even minor fluctuation compared to what happened 10 to 12,000 years ago. It's almost something like when you start to look into it and what it, the effects that it could have had on earth it's it really is like something out of a hollywood movie when you start to incorporate yeah, yeah. the potential so when you look at uh, the soil strata there's this black sedimentary layer that tells us that there were wildfires maybe sky fires over a huge region of planet earth at about that time does that repeat in the ice core studies yeah what we find is that our climate shifted so violently that I think the burning of the, of the sediment layer that you mentioned is from a combination of two different things. May have been like literally like massive global wildfires, but also what I think was probably a massive solar outburst from the sun. I think really the reason why the ancient cultures were tracking, um, well, there's many reasons, but one of the reasons why I think the ancient cultures were tracking the changes with the zodiac and the different ages was that they knew that our sun goes th and our earth for that matter go through very distinct changes as the sun goes through what's called a solar maximum to a solar minimum and then from a solar maximum to a solar minimum it, the, the, it, as it goes back and forth 
it looks like every 10 to 12,000 years, potentially, there's one, one of these solar maximum or minimum changes with the sun. And when I look at a timeline of 200,000 years, and we have this disaster lodged right here at 12,000 years ago, it does bring up the question of, well, and I, and I fully understand this. That's why I, I try to be open about this. But if the Sumerian kinglets and other ancient tablets are talking about disasters, could that have even been like a previous disaster? We don't really know how many of these disasters have happened over the course of a 200,000 year history that's then wiped out the previous civilization for, to then have them rebuild. But the one thing I will say, Paul, is that the data we have from 12,000 years ago and looking at the fact that our Earth was in a massive ice age, where as I'm speaking to you right now in Maine, I had one to two miles of ice above my head, slowly carving its way around the, ac across the landscape. It looks like that ice melted extremely quickly. And when you have types of those types of events on a, on a magnitude of two, three times anything we've ever seen in our r recent human history, it really makes you ask the question of, well, did ancient cataclysms wipe out a civilization or civilizations that were in some ways more sophisticated than we were, than we are now? Definitely. Certainly my studies in ancient mythologies, including Genesis, suggest to me that the recollection of a number of planetary resets like that, resets of civilization, are embedded in our ancient memory. And you mentioned sea levels. Um, because we can find evidence of cities that would have been last above water about 10,000 years ago. What's interesting about these is that they still look like us. When we find these remains, even Gobekli Tepe, there's a sophistication, as you say, in terms of their knowledge of, of the stars, their, their tracking of the Earth's procession. Um, but it still looks like human stone built structures so how do you read that has it always been human society has every reboot been humans then more humans or is it a more complicated picture i think it's when we look at something like the drake equation which i mention all the time and we consider how vast the universe is and how many different um, star systems are in different ages with completely different time periods of when sentient beings could have reached higher states. And when we really look at this larger picture of, of how vast everything is, to try to think that we're the only ones here that have, that have ever been here and there's never been any influences, I really think that and I'm not, I don't necessarily try to just put on a hat that says aliens. I like to think of it in a much more complicated way. I like to think of it as beings sentient beings throughout the universe that some have likely traveled here in one way or another and i think one of the pieces of evidence that is really really um points to that in a very very st a strong way and i know there's there's naysayers out there that may be listening and saying come on really you're gonna you're gonna go down that route again well the evidence we get that really points to that that starts to point to the fact that there's least influences outside of here some kind of influences are places like Gobekli Tepe, believe it or not, when they were digging down through Gobekli Tepe, they found something really strange. They find they found that in some of the layers that existed, they found hunter-gatherer tools. They found just like, oh yeah, okay, so the story we're told, right? So they're hunter-gatherers moving through the landscape and learning and as, as they go along, but then right next to it, out of nowhere, in the layer right next to that same layer or right above it, boom, agriculture just comes out of nowhere. And we're talking about sophisticated agriculture, where, in, so this story that yeah. we're told, just to back up a little bit, so we're, we're, we're told that, okay, so hunter-gatherers are traveling through the landscape and they find this spot where Gobekli Tepe is, this location, and which is called Potbelly Hill, and they decide that they're going to create one of the most sophisticated astronomical temples ever built in human history for no reason at all just there. So it starts to bring up these questions. And then when you look at what I call the megalithic building all around the world, these massive blocks that are created with precision, with stone tools that are impossible that go along with our timeline, Bronze Age, right up through the age we have now with diamond tip, tip, tip blades, 
some of these materials, these these granites, these b- volcanic type of basalts that were that we find from India all the way through into Turkey, down into Petra Jordan, all around the world, and especially into places like Peru, those types of stones, those rocks cut with that precision would have been impossible. We, according to the Mohs hardness scale, with the Bronze Age tools and Iron Age tools, with what we're told in human history, you would it would be like trying to take one of those hammers and chisels and banging it up against one of those Aswan quarry granite, beautiful stones that they that they built, those incredible um, monoliths, basically, those out in, in, um, in southern Egypt. Trying to, you'd be banging on one of those pieces of granite and your tool would literally break in half. It would just disintegrate. The, the blade would break. So then who carved these, these tools? I mean, who carved these stones? Why in Aswan, Egypt, in the quarries, are we finding this very strange scoop mark where the rock was literally scooped out? And we're talking about some of the hardest rock in the world. Scooped out like it's some kind of a child's Play-Doh. And then these rocks out in, in Peru, looking at a place like Saxe Human, Ole Te Tambo, right across Pumapunku, Tiwanaku, these stones, some of them look like they were literally melted and then molded into place. The point I'm trying to get at is when you look at just the sophisticated and agri- um, in, in the design of these structures, the tools that were told that they were used to build them would have been impossible. Means it, we know that that's part of a much older civilization. But what really gets me excited, even beyond that, is when I start to get into the heart of these tablets and these ancient writings like you look at, looking at the Book of Enoch, when they they clearly talk very extensively about what we refer to much later in religion as things like angels and demons, and how there seem to be these influences and, and this this wisdom that was imparted on certain civilizations. But But in many ways, it wasn't even that. They were actually designed in the image of how they wanted they wanted those cities to go um and i really quickly paul before you jump in i want to just mention there was a great article that just got posted about this tablet called the cirrus cylinder king cirrus that that came out of um basically conquered um the iranian persian area and came in and and then then conquered uh, mesopotamia and took over babylon in that tablet it's it's amazing cirrus cirrus the great he says in that that when he conquered Babylon, that he basically bowed down to this god named Bel, who we know was Marduk, which was the, was the chief deity, the god of Babylon. He states in that it's not like he conquered the city and he was king, he could do whatever he wanted. No, the first thing he says in this tablet is that he bowed down to its god Marduk or Bel and basically asked him for how, how he wanted the city to be ruled and designed in his image. These kings were scared to death of these beings, these gods, as they were called. This this is not an archetype out of the human imagination to describe some force of nature or some way that, that we can describe ourselves. There was definitely influences, and I have a lot of other examples as we go along here, to prove that we were given this knowledge and information and the design of our civilizations behind very specific means. Definitely. There's so many interesting things happening in that moment because yeah. moment because you just to go back to go back to Tepe, there we have an advanced uh, civilization advanced megalithic civilization is constructed uh, this incredible astronomical site and they seem to be bumping up against a society of hunting hunter gatherers who then miraculously discover how to genetically modify 11 crops and invent farming so the yeah, possibility exactly. that is that you've got one culture informing the beginning of another culture but then as you just referenced there are these sources that talk about a night and day difference between those who taught and those who learned and if you listen to the indigenous stories of uh, native american culture or uh, aboriginal stories from australia they will talk very openly about people having come from somewhere else who are unimaginably more advanced than we are, teaching us the rudiments of life on planet Earth, about food, about medicines, about agriculture. And those stories are open that this is a different kind of being. They're not the survivors of an earlier culture, but they are another kind of being. 
and what you talk about there with uh, Cyrus is, is another, for instance. And it seems to me that we find that depicted in um, ancient carvings all around the world, where we see human kings bowing to these beings who are far larger and clearly superior. It seems to echo through a lot of different cultures. Yeah, it really does. And it, it gives existed. Give you an example. When we look at something like probably what is un, definitely the most famous of all cuneiform tablets, the Epic of Gilgamesh. When you look at murals of Gilgamesh itself, and I, this is something I love to talk about because it's it's really um, quite remarkable. The murals of Gilgamesh, and there's multiple murals of him that show him with um, a full this, this big lion. But in the mural, the lion is the size of a house cat. And, and what makes that so peculiar is, well, how do you know that's a full-grown lion? Well, if you do just a quick little search online with lions, you know that a lion can only have a mane if it's a mature lion. And so Gilgamesh has this giant lion, one of the largest cats in the world, and he, it's sitting on his lap and it's no bigger than a house cat. Over and over and over again, it seems like these kings like that are mentioned in the Sumerian king list and Epic of Gilgamesh and Atrahasis, they're talking about time periods that are so long ago that we don't even represent the same age or height that they, that they even were around. And when we, give me an example. In all the way across in the Americas, when they first um, started excavating what are known as these serpent burial mounds in the Mississippi Valley of the United States with a lot of these ancient indigenous cultures, they found, um, I think it's something like, like at least half a dozen or more of these giant skeletons that were been buried in these mounds that were almost like um, representing like a like a, a dirt pyramid. And as you travel further south, you find those same mounds in Mexico, but they get bigger and bigger and bigger, like from Guadalajara southeast until you get into the Aztec. And then all of a sudden they turn into pyramids. Like there was different levels of knowledge given to different cultures at different times. And they were all trying to mimic each other and and pay homage to what seemed like these great lineage of heroes and in what we would refer to as giants like what what is mentioned in the book of genesis talking about these great giants that were once here long ago and they were no longer here anymore um one of the things i i love to bring up every time is that one of the greatest pieces of evidence that proves that giants were real was looking at the story of um you know when people were sailing around the, the ocean, um, discovering different places. Um, the famous sailor Magellan, the Straits of Magellan off of South America, Patagonia. Um, go look into the story of Magellan, but not the story that we're given in books. Do a little research into his route and what they discovered along that route. When he was sailing through the Straits of Magellan, he, um, they went ashore to get supplies. And in, in the notes that were written by his number one man is in command it was basically recording all the events on this journey they would have basically a big a notepad where they would write down each day what they saw what they encountered and they would they would file it all and then bring it back home well some of those records were buried and no one ever heard of them again because when magellan came back he brought these stories with him of how when they went inland around patagonia they encountered giant men over 10 feet tall in some cases and some of them were really violent and they were forced to go back in their ship and sail back back home. But why aren't any of those stories in our books? Well, clearly there's a history that goes back that includes ancient lineages and ancient bloodlines that seem to be um, either not present today or in such a um, muted way that there's only just little remnants of them that still exist, I think. It's fascinating, isn't it? We, we have references like that from Magellan. We find it in Egyptian carvings. We find it in Sumerian carvings. There are some really interesting finds in North America, giant uh, remains of giants in the uh, 1800s. How did it become so controver controversial? Because who was it? It was a, a speech by Abraham Lincoln, wasn't it? Making reference to the giants who used to live in that land, in that region he was standing in. Um, evidently, we still have remains that were found at that time. They're all archived somewhere in the Smithsonian. Today, though, it seems to be 
uh, you're labeled as fringe if you want to shine any light on this. So if you want to talk about it, why, why is it controversial? And why do we not have um, reams and reams of the results of DNA testing on the finds that do exist, including the, the tomb of Gilgamesh that they found in Iraq in 2003? We live in a, a, a situation right now. And I, I, sometimes I try to envision the place we're in on a, in a terms of a um, social conditioning level. We've been conditioned to a point now where we exist in a reality where if you try to challenge anything that goes along with this mainstream view, it doesn't even have to be giants. It could be anything, even just these megalithic structures around the world and, and their age and how they're older. Anything that challenges this doctrine of history that we've been taught, you are immediately labeled as a conspiracy theory slash nut job. And this is a way to very decisively shut out those voices that are trying to objectively figure things out. Because think about it, right? You go into a room full of people and you start to bring up some of these, 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 these ideas, right? Did you know, right, that in the 1800s, in the Wisconsin Telegraph or whatever it was, they reported that they uncovered this nine-foot skeleton in this mound. You bring that up to a party, right? Everyone's like, oh, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Then you go, did you also know that the Smithsonian, supposedly all of these skeletons have disappeared and no one's ever seen them again and, and none of this was researched? All of a sudden, those eye rolls are going to go. Boom. You have triggered the un, undiscussable, the forbidden knowledge that goes against this doctrine we've been taught. And people have been so conditioned that they don't even think that way. They don't go, oh, here it goes. Quick, put the brakes on. I can't think about this. It's so ingrained that it just happens without even knowing it. And that's the way that most people view this type of inf information is that you're not even allowed to talk about it. You're not even allowed to discuss it because it's impossible. It's not, it's not even out there. So how did this all come to be? Well, you got to walk down that conspiracy road because really the more you look at it, the more the evidence is almost screaming and shouting to be seen. And what we find is that there have been powerful secret societies throughout history, and some of them have managed to seize control of massive amounts of information. One of those places where that information was hijacked was during, was during the Roman Empire. Um, in the city of Constantinople, Constantine, the great, great uh, emperor of, of um, the Roman Empire, he decided, hey, it would be pretty smart if we could just write whatever history timeline we wanted to and then give that to the people as what happened. And you start to see that there's a lot of these aspects of religion and also looking at it more of as a spiritual side of religion and, and what we are as a conscious um, conscious being, but also just the, the, the timeline of history and, and what these events and where they, where they landed, that whole timeline has been so skewed and so manipulated that we really have a very, very um, misunderstood and almost lost understanding of this incredible epic or epics that preceded us. And I think that when you start to open up that rabbit hole of, well, you go down, you start to ask a few questions, before you know it, this, inc this, this history unfolds before us that um, really opens up those really big questions, Paul, like you brought up. And, th and this is how simple it gets. If ocean this, levels, this, go ahead. No, carry on. If ocean levels were 400 feet lower during the before the last ice age melted, and we have cities that are underwater, it means that those cities were built before ocean levels rose. It gets as simple as that. It's that there simple. Are, there are so many holes, Paul, and I just want to end up by saying there are so many holes that as we start to piece these together we find that it's almost a mountain of information that's being held back instead of just a little molehill. Yes, I think the study of history is just so important. I think at right, at now, right in, now in Australia, they are prioritizing uh, degrees in maths and engineering. Um, there's spaces for that, there's money for that, but it's going to cost you twice that amount if you want to study history. Well, in my book, studying history is vitally important, and you don't have to study too much history to understand how governing powers want to control the narrative. 
the ones in charge want to tell you what is the real news and the fake news. Um, you know, that's been obvious when we've looked at other cultures. The Soviet Union we used to laugh at their official news agency telling everyone what was fact and everything else was conspiracy. We're kind of all in that same boat, but the Roman Empire are a great object lesson in how this works. And there's an amazing moment uh, after the time of Constantine when Emperor Theodosius illegalized uh, all religions outside of Christianity. And that meant um, archiving or destroying all the other narrative traditions, rounding up old priesthoods so that they couldn't operate anymore. And so deliberately shutting down other layers of history and story and interpretation. And when you read the story of Theodosius, it's easy to recognize other versions of the same thing happening in other cultures. Um, it, it's, it's such a, history is a wonderful thing because it allows us to be more open-eyed as we look at what's happening in the world around us. I think for me, my, my advantage is being a bit older. And so I've, I've seen enough moments in history where the official story of what happened clearly has left some facts out. And you've only got to come across one story of, oh, actually, we now know that isn't what happened, before you're beginning to give yourself permission to say, I'm going to question some other stories as well. I do think, though, we're in a, in a, in a cultural moment when more people are willing to say, yes, I'm not sure what I think about that. I'm not sure if I really do believe that. It can be dismaying. I mean, you were talking what happens when you say, oh, there's this stuff at the Smithsonian that's been buried or gotten rid of, and people roll their eyes and say, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist, I can now ignore you. Yes, there is a lot of that. But I do think we're at a moment in our, the story of our culture where we're waking up a bit and saying, no, I, I really do want to know what happened. I'm not just going to go with the... Um, the Disney version of our history at that point. But uh, bring us to another moment on your timeline that you think is a real pivot and has got uh, got some uh, time bomb information in it. Sure. Um, I guess, I, you know, I, we did talk about a lot of areas sort of jumbled, so I'll try to go back and we get some order here. Um, just quickly as I run through this, Looking at cities like Lagash, Bad Tabir, and Shirupak that are mentioned on the Sumerian king list, we get some interesting um, data where it talks about how those cities were then destroyed by great disasters and catastrophes like we, we mentioned. But one of the things that is important is that when we look at stories of Atlantis and we look at how Atlantis was destroyed and knowledge had to be preserved somewhere and then cultures like the ancient Egyptians at Akemet or Kem all of a sudden these incredible pyramids are built and all of this understanding of the electromagnetic grid and energy ley lines when we look at the fact that these disasters seem to be these global disasters and these structures seem to be built on these precise energy ley lines of where balancing our planet is it brings up the question of whether or not these structures were built to just simply harness energy and raise human consciousness or whether or not they could even have built as a way to try to balance our planet to prevent these destructive events to occur. So I put down the pyramids of, of Kemet, Egypt, in the location mm. right before the deluges and the destruction of our world because when we look at how the dynastic Egyptians um, came in and then wrote all their hieroglyphics on, on all the, you know, the great temples and a lot of the structures there, but they took, and they essentially took credit for their creation. We say, okay, so there, So instead of looking at this in a, in a one-way, linear way, instead of saying there's an ancient Egyptian culture and there's an ancient Mesopotamian culture, what about if there's different periods of those cultures, right? So when we look at something like the, um, the pre-Inca, the Inca that built these incredible structures like in Machu Picchu, and then you see how right on top of them, there's these very, this very primitive mortar building which lacked all the sophistication of their ancestors. So that tells you that, okay, so instead of saying Inca, there are multiple versions of different epics even within that culture alone. And I think that's the narrative that we go around the world here, and that's why I try to put these key moments in that seem to make sense for that.
So dynastic Egypt is very, very impressive. And then pre-dynastic Egypt is even more impressive. And we're not quite sure where it came from. And in between the two, it looks like there was some kind of a cataclysm. There's evidence of a flood damage. Yeah. Uh, so that's an interesting moment in itself. When we get to Plato, I'm really intrigued by him. He refers to the knowledge that was curated by the priesthood of dynastic Egypt. So can you tie some of that together for us? Atlantis, pre-dynastic, and then dynastic Egypt. What's happening in that yeah. moment? Yeah, when, when we look at a couple areas, like you mentioned that the story of um, Atlantis that Plato got was from ancient Egyptian knowledge. Okay, that's how we know that Egypt had a connection to Atlantis. It's not just out of the blue where we think it might be connected. We know that that connection exists. And then whether or not you believe them or not, and I believe that they are, they are credible and genuine, when you look at things like the Emerald Tablets of Thoth and you read about ancient Atlantis and how Egypt was created out of the image of Atlantis to create a new civilization. Then you go across the world to places like Tula, Mexico, with these great Atlantean warriors. You start to say, okay, so Atlantis and those individuals that were in Atlantis looks like they influenced Egypt, looks like they influenced some parts of the Americas. We're talking about a, a very a grand civilization that seemed to have existed that was completely wiped out. And before that civilization was wiped out by great earth changes and maybe a number of other ways as well, is that we tried to, they, they tried to create and essentially protect this knowledge by creating other civilizations around the world. So that's why we try to place the pyramids of Egypt where we do, and then we get to other areas like the pre-Inca, the Olmec, and the Aztec, and the Indus Valley civilizations. And I basically, I, I lump it this way. If there's any advanced, sophisticated building that we find with things that it could ex would exceed the, the tools that we're told were around during the Iron Age and Bronze Age, then it means that those were from the lost civilizations. These, that means that there are civilizations around the world that were influenced by similar means that were then all destroyed. They were wiped out. And those are the civilizations that left most of this ancient evidence. But, so how do we place the rest of it? Well, in um, a tablet called The Legend of Atana, it's, he starts out by stating that when the old world was destroyed, he was basically um, counseled to create an entirely new civilization in the image of the old world in a place called the city of Kish. And that, that city still exists today in, in, a rum, in a ruined state. But he very st specifically mentions that he was tasked by the gods to be an archetype of the new world. Not just Kish, not just the town and the region he was part of, but to be an archetype of the entire new world. To redesign and re-lower what they called kingship to create this structure to a certain way that civilization was supposed to be created based on the way that it was before. So it really brings up the questions of, well, how many times have disasters wiped out and reset this and that it had to be created again and re-lowered through kingship? Do you know much about the uh, connection between the uh, civilizations of the Indus Valley, Indus Valley and the ancient yeah, that's, that's a tough one. We don't have a lot of information. When we read ancient Hindu writings that go back, and we don't really even have, even have a date on how old they, are, they actually are, but if you read the Bhagavad Gita and you start looking into Krishna talking to Arjun about um, the nature of reality and, and what the state of our consciousness is within this reality, um, they clearly talk about how there was a great history that even preceded him and how a lot of that knowledge has been muddied and, and lost over time. And so he's trying to educate Krishna, this, this God figure, is trying to educate Arjun to the old ways and the knowledge of, of the past. Now, when I take that type of information, those ancient writings that seem to mimic the story of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, to me, mimics almost in the same way of when we look at the story of Poimander, Poimander and Hermes, these ancient Hermetic stories, it seems to be the same story. It's this 
intelligent, super intelligent God figure being that seems to be having this conversation with an incredibly enlightened and advanced human of some kind that's trying to educate him about the ways of reality. And in many, in every case, it seems like those interactions are always with something that's supreme over, over our understanding of reality. And so the reason I put the Indus Valley civilizations where I do is because we find not only glitching a little bit. there. Okay. You, I might, can you hear me? Yeah. Just say that last bit again. The reason why, the other reason why we, we, I put the Indus Valley civilizations where I do is not just because of those ancient writings that mimic a lot of other old ancient writings that, that are in the same time period, but because we find that the structures themselves, whether it's Barbara Hill Caves, Alora Caves with Kalesh Temple, or down in um, Kanhari Caves, whatever it is, these ancient Indus Valley civilizations that are carved these structures, they were carved into solid basalt. And they're so sophisticated that they mimic in many ways a lot of this other building we find in places like Peru. Now, I have a little tidbit, Paul, that you I don't know if you've heard of yet, and I mentioned in a previous one of my presentations, um, in studying these tablets, there was an ancient Mesopotamian tablet that came up that I think is incredibly important. I don't know if it's got a lot of attention, but it's called Enki in the World Order. And I highly recommend people go to find that. It was actually something that my wife found and shared with me, and then I it blew my mind because what it talks about is not only does it mention Eridu as his first city ever, so it gives you a little bit of time frame of where it happened, but it mentions how he's having this conversation with this other deity goddess named Anana, and he says to her, what are you complaining about? You have all these different regions that you rule over. What, what do you need more for? And he lists them off and he talks about how the regions that are connected through trade and information, direct connections with those cultures. He mentions this region of Dilmun and Maluha in the tablet of with the same age and the time period of Eridu. So we know, and this is Enki speaking to Anana, we know that this is an ancient writing. And what, what's so important about that? Well, if you look into where Dilmun is, it is the region of Saudi Arabia, Iran, right through the Persian area. Well, we're not told that that's connected, but it, it says right in here it was. But even more importantly, he mentions Maluha. And if you look into where that region was, and I'll give a spelling because I might be slightly butchering that name, but it's M-U-L-U-H-H-A. If you go type that in and find out where that is, it's India. And so it's telling you that in ancient times, all of those cultures were connected, all of them. And that's how you say, okay, that makes so much sense. They had the ancient writings that match. They have the building sophistication that matches the same type of thing. Of course, they were all influenced together. And I think that's how we can, we should be looking at a lot of where these pieces fit in. It seems to me that the more we actually dig, the larger the scale of the previous civilizations seems to become. I know uh, Anselm Pirambla is doing South America that is showing a pre previous civilization on a phenomenal scale that connects yeah. all the megalith cultures we know about in South America. Just the scale of it, it's, I think it's kind of frightening for people to think that a global civilization, which is what it looks like, could be extinguished and forgotten. And we don't want to believe that we live on a planet that's that vulnerable. And so without um, getting too far into conspiracy theories, I think just it's frightening to realize that we're not the first ones here and that we don't hardly know the first thing about the civilizations that have preceded us. I think that's one of the reasons why people get a little bit nervous talking about these things, our own fragility. Well, maybe they should get a little nervous because when we look at these cycles and we look at where we are right now, we have to really ask the question of, well, wait a minute. So why have we seen year after year after year the ancient Inuits saying that the stars have changed position in our sky? And then they're talking about how, well, wait a minute, magnetic north is no longer where it used to be. It's shifting and moving around in different places and we're having to go up and remap it again. We see earthquakes and uh, and I'm not trying to be fear doom and gloom this is just facts we see more earthquake 
activity and volcanic activity than we've seen in, in potentially human history since records at least began when we were actually writing down that data. We really start, we have to start asking questions about whether or not we're in one of those cycles. And I think the real takeaway from that is, can we learn the lessons that are necessary to be able to make it to the next stage of the golden age, as they've called it, of human civilization? Or are we going to also just become a memory of a, of a great military plastic civilization that really polluted its world and, and didn't really take, have respect for it and it was wiped out based on their lack of respect for what they were part of. Um, and I think that the more I look at things though, right now, to take it the complete other direction, okay? The more I look at things, I, there's very important things to point out about that so that people aren't afraid. It doesn't mean you shouldn't take it seriously and pay attention and, and be looking at what's going on around you. But number one, we don't have an ice age right now. That's huge. If you consider that the, the water on our earth, we only have a certain amount of water. And if that water is locked up in ice and it melts, it would cause massive problems. And that water just doesn't exist in that state anymore. Therefore, the, the, when we look at other aspects like, well, what is all this weird technology that's being used in potentially like Antarctica and the North Pole? Admiral Byrd flying over the North Pole and seeing some weird stuff up there. Have they been using some of this ex-Nazi technology to try to prevent some kind of a disaster secretly? Is that why things like chemtrails are occurring? So they can, they can potentially hide the fact that there are a lot of scary things that are being prevented quietly in the background so we can keep this thing going without panic and fear from the population. I think that's a really viable thing. And I, I, but I, I see a lot of, um, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Like you said, there are more young people because of the internet and the way that we are open, more open-minded in, in, in this time period, there are more people researching this than, than ever before. And so I'm excited the potential of where we could go in the next stage here of, of our story. Definitely. Uh, it certainly feels like we're in a, um, uh, uh, coming into a vulnerable moment in our planet's history. If you read Plato and if you take his theory seriously, we're long overdue for a reset because his belief was that it's every 5,000 years or so that something happens to reboot civilization on planet Earth, we, we seem to have been going for about 10,000 years without a solar flare wiping us out or triggering an ice age or being bombarded by comets or asteroids. Um, just that timeline itself makes me think, mm, we need to be doing some serious thought right now with regard to our longevity. Well, and I guess some could even argue that if some of this is um, somehow more controlled and less random than we think that maybe this window that we've been given that's longer than others is perhaps because, like the ancients have said, maybe this is the time that we're supposed to reach the next stage and they weren't really allowed to in some cases. You know, this is the time when humanity is supposed to take the next step forward into the universe and become a truly conscious eternal being. And, you know, if we had a wipeout right now, that wouldn't happen we'd have to start over again. So, you know, is that That's purposeful, right. right? Well, Carl Sagan uh, said on many occasions that it's our responsibility to become a space-faring civilization because if we don't, then there's a finite timeline on our civilization. And, I mean, you couldn't find somebody whose public statements were more grounded uh, than Carl Sagan. And that was his prophetic message to the world. Yeah, he's a he's a great hero of mine. I think it was one of these rare one of these rare moments back then where someone who was a public figure was willing to step out of the bounds of their constraints to make people at least think in a much more open minded way about just the fact that we're in this vast cosmos and what you know what part do we play here? The whole the whole pale dot. I feel like the pale blue dot. And thinking about that in that type of conscious reaction and perspective is one of the most important things that we've lost that we take so for granted. Because when you think about, and for those who don't know, I'm referring to when um, one of the, the, the last transmissions from one of our probes basically looked back at Earth um, 
we were this just this tiny little pale blue dot in the surrounded by the the darkness of this vast cosmos which isn't really dark but it's just our perception of it and what i think the takeaway of that is when we look at it from that perspective of consciousness of what part we play in this vast cosmos it makes all of this other silliness this illusion here that that binds us by all these things that we're fighting over and in terms of reality shows and going shopping all the time and thinking that everything's about just looks and money and materialism it makes everything have to be reevaluated and it makes us look at everything in a way that i think the ancients looked at things to try to get our perspective right all along definitely okay matt take us back to atrahasis okay so atrahasis is probably my favorite cuneiform tablet of all time because it it not only contains um, an understanding of this time period in terms of when cities were around, but it, it goes every, all the way back to talking about mankind's origins, great cataclysms and, and disasters, and the roles that different gods, these gods they called them, these, these powerful supreme beings, whatever you want to refer to them as, what role they played within um, our story. Now, one of the interesting things about what, what I referred to the Sumerians as the Anunnaki, um, they've been called many, many names throughout throughout history. I think they're most likely connected to Asuras and Divas in Hindu mythology, perhaps the Jinn in Arabian mythology. Um, we could go on and on and on. Seems like there just are there's a an intense competition over what happens in our reality and and how our story unfolds and where we go. And it seems like the competition is about well. If you create a civilization in a certain image you want them with certain laws and rules and moral code, what will that civilization turn into? And I think this is a great learning lesson actually to reflect on ourselves where just really quick before I go into the Atrahasis, when you look at something like the Roman Empire and you had a situation where money's being used for a massive war front to try to conquer and take over these huge areas but at home in these capital cities like in rome the people are you know there's food is hard to come by people are starving they're angry and so they're acting out and so what do they do they create these great games to not only distract people but they condition them through violence to have a certain kind of society act a certain way and then to be reflected in that later on you saw this time and time again in cities throughout the world and they weren't always conditioned through violence and fear but it shows you that that can happen very easily depending on the type of leadership and the types of rules and laws that are created for that well Andrahasis tells us some really interesting things he tells us some specifics about when certain things existed and then when they weren't around anymore and they were much older. What in, in Atrahasis, the story of Atrahasis, he is supposedly one of the, the only um, individuals who gets out of this catastrophe because he's warned by Enki. And he's only supposedly warned in, this, in the story because he had a direct bloodline connection with Enki in this, in this ancestral, ancient bloodline of the gods, okay? Now... But he mentions how he's the last of a great line of kings that then essentially after he's gone or after his story ends, I guess you could say, there's no more like him. And, I, and the, the reason I point that out is in the Epic of Gilgamesh, I feel like the Epic of Gilgamesh might be one of the greatest misunderstood and ignored tablets. People see it as a great poem, and I think they they look at the moral lessons that are, in, that are ta taught to you through these – quest that they go out on Gilgamesh goes on this great quest to seek you know certain things and he's a, he, he this hero path but what it I think what it ignores that people don't really pay attention to are some of the specifics that comes up where Gilgamesh on this great quest he's seeking immortality specifically he wants to live forever and he goes to what seems like in the story a physical place but the more you read about it it seems like maybe he was going to some kind of a non-physical place to seek this this journey and what he, meet, he meets the whole point of it is he goes to find Atrahasis who in that story is known as Untipishti these names that are used for these different individuals changes depending on the different time period in which it's written these 
these individuals had different names just based on um, different ages. But if you connect them, you start to say, oh, okay, so Atrahasis is the same individual as the, la- the, as the later religious Noah, who's also the same as the flood hero Zayasudra or Untipishti. You say, okay, so that's all the same person. That's, that's, once you know that, you start to piece together some really incredible things. And one of my favorite things about in the Epic of Gilgamesh that connects this whole story it's one of my the greatest moments, I think, of realization when you're reading this and you say, oh, my God, like there's a clue to this entire lost story that we have. He f- says in a Gilgamesh, he f- he seeks out, um, we'll call him Madrahasis in, in, because of the timeline. OK, his name is Zaya Sudra also. He calls him the flood hero. And he seeks him because Adrahasis is supposed to be the only um, historical figure, I'll call them, who had found found their immortality and it could live forever that's what he states and you, you're like well that's really interesting because he comes from an ancient bloodline the sumerian king list that supposedly could live a really long time so gilgamesh finds him he seeks him out and it, it, he, this whole story unfolds where like they he goes across this abyss and he enters this realm where atrahasis exists it doesn't seem like it's part of the, our world because Atra, atrahasis tells him that there were things that occurred long ago that are no longer here anymore. He says, for instance, he tells him a story about when humanity and humans in, in this age became mortal. He tells him the entire story. He says, basically, there were once gods that walked among us, and those gods departed our world. But he says in a very specific way, he says that when the great deluge came and destroyed everything, it, the, the gods were feared it so much, the power of it and what it did that they they left our realm and the, and they were and they and they disappeared from our direct influence with mankind. And he says specifically something that is amazing to me. He mentions the city of Shurupak. What's so amazing about that is that Atrahasis was the last king of the city of Shurupak, which means that he would know what happened to that city before the flood. But in Gilgamesh mentions that. He meets this flood hero, Atrahasis, who then tells him this story of when humans were immortal. And he says that it, it last occurred in this city of Shurupak. That's when this great divide occurred. But what he says is so interesting is he says, the city of Shurupak, and he specifically mentions that it's so ancient and so old that the gods, like I mentioned, once walked among the men there, and then they departed and left our reality. But what's so mind blowing about that to me is that when Gilgamesh was around, as a as a giant with this lion sitting on his lap that's the size of a house cat, he's still part of this giant genetics of the gods. This story of Shurupak and Atrahasis and the Sumerian king list and all of this is already ancient. And the other thing that he's, the reason why I, can, I mention I place the Epic of Gilgamesh here is that on that journey to find Atrahasis, he encounters, and this is how I know it's a non physical place, he says he encounters the spirit or ghost of Atana. Now, why is that interesting? Well, Atana, if you remember, if I, when I mentioned before, was the, the, the story of the cuneiform tablet called The Legend of Atana, he was the, the king that was, was created there as the new world architect to create the new world in the image of the gods, this, this king named Atana. But when Gilgamesh goes on this quest to seek, to seek immortality, he meets the spirit of Atana, which means that Atana has already been dead for a, a great amount of time, and he's already an ancient king. So that's how you can keep placing these things. Okay, so Atana's older than Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh comes in this later time period, but Gilgamesh is a giant. So it means he had to have been part of a much older story. And this is why, Paul, that I have not two time periods for this what we think of as the Mesopotamian ancient Sumerians of the area, but I have three. Because the piece of information that I bring in to connect that is... This library that I told you about, in the, right when I first started this whole conversation, when I said that Austin Henry, Austin Henry Layard had discovered this great library in Mesopotamia, in Nineveh, in 1849, the Ashurbanipal Library. That king, Ashurbanipal, that amassed that library, when you read the writings of him, 
when that he when he's got these scribes talking about it, he was obsessed with these cuneiform tablets. He felt like the the, the great story of our past and understanding everything could be found in these words. And so it, what he says in these in his writings that is it's, it's so mind blowing to me to try to like place all these in my in my head on a on a time scale is that he states that that these tablets when he was alive this 4000 BCE when he was alive these tablets were so ancient that they had to go find them buried under layers of dirt in some cases in in ancient cities that were long ago gone so that tells you right there that okay so Atrahasis when he digs up the library of Ashurbanipal and he finds the epic of Gilgamesh that means that Gilgamesh was much older than Atrabanapal because he's finding these tablets that have been in these ancient libraries that have been in, in temples. So that's how I tried to piece this whole get thing together. But it seems like there have been these multiple epics over and over again. And we're just now piecing this incredible story together, Paul. Absolutely. But when we are allowed to gather once again and uh, go to meetings and things, you should be running some retreats where we can just sit at your feet for a whole weekend and uh, decant all this information out of you. Have you got this coming forward in a book in the meanwhile? Some of this, um, or a good deal of this, I talk about in my latest book, The Stage of Time. Um, and, and, but in terms of going forward with some of this newer information and piecing the whole timeline together, um, I may be releasing a co-writing a book with Billy Carson, which I'm going to try to include this timeline and try to break the whole thing down because I really do think that when we can piece these events together, we unfold a story that is so much greater and so much more complicated and incredible that just has us understand, well, okay, so we are these sentient beings that seem to be created in the image of these gods that seem to want to create these civilizations. Like we're created in their image, not the other way around. And that's why we seem like Lloyd Pye has pointed out, we seem so strange and unusual for this world that we're part of if it's just purely based on Darwinian evolutionary means with no outside influence. So over and over again, we seem to get this understanding that I, this is the reason I'm mentioning this, Paul. Some people will be like, why, what, what do I care about understanding all this? Like, what does it really do for me, though? What it does is it allows us to understand that we're basically creator gods here that have been made to believe that we are nothing and that we are just we just die and, that, and then we turn into um, the dirt and the soil and then there's nothing else that exists beyond us but consciousness is an eternal energy and if we're part of something much greater and that we have the potential to be those creator gods that bring ideas and then turn them into something real and then it allow that to then transform our entire civilization to then move us forward that's how we're creator gods here and i think that by us studying our past and understanding all of these ancient stories and these incredible structures that were created, not to have an office building for some company to work in, but to maybe balance the energy of our ley lines of our planet and, and within the cosmos itself, we can start to reevaluate and, and look at ourselves and what we're doing here in a completely different light. That's exactly right. I, understanding our origins is all about understanding our potential and who we are and how we can live and to have a far more empowering cosmic vision of who and what we are as human beings. I'm absolutely with you. I'm going to be, I'm going to be holding out for that book. I'll be pre-ordering your book with Billy Carson. Keep us posted on that. And in the meantime, how can we keep up with what you're doing? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, I have a YouTube page, uh, Matthew LaCroix, L-A-C-R-O-I-X. I love to create content. That's one of the things besides an ancient researcher, I, if I, I really do wish, and I don't, a lot of people don't know, but I, I have a full-time job and I, I try to juggle all this because I love it. It is like the core of who I am and my passion as, a, as I feel like the purpose of what I want to contribute here. But so I try to do as much as I can to get all this message out, but the point I'm trying to make is I hope someday I can do this on a full-time level because I, I love to create videos. I love to give discussions. I would love to go out and, like you said, have retreats in some of these locations and explore them because we should be given these this information. These This is the most 
um, incredible thing that we could uncover because I think it would move us forward basically the next step. Um, and then I just want to also mention uh, my website, thestageoftime.com, has this timeline as well as a lot of uh, the other work that I've done. But I, um, it really is an honor to work with someone like you, Paul. I have a lot of respect for the, the research and the writing you've done. Matt, thank you so much for being with us again. It's always enjoyable talking to you. We would love to have you back again and just drill down into some more of these moments. But in the meantime, thanks so much for joining us today on The Fifth Kind TV. Thanks so much, guys. I look forward to the next time.